Welcome to this short presentation of teratology principles. This presentation should be read. The oral, the oral comments are minimal. I like only to share with you that there is no spontaneous generation in the progress of science. During the 19th century, studies of embryology and embryologic pathology led to the flourishing of teratology. And from there, it moved into clinical teratology. James J. Wilson was a collaborator of Joseph Workany. Joseph Workany was the first to conclusively demonstrate that environmental factors can be a cause of congenital malformations. Up to that point, the dogma held that congenital malformations had to be genetic in nature. And much of such view persists. Thus, the principle of teratology are fundamental and distinguish this new clinical science from generalities of toxicology. The first of the principles underscores that the susceptibility to a teratogen reflects the genotype not only of the fetus, but also of the mother and the interplay with each other. It is known that diverse species are more or less sensitive to different medications, toxins, and teratogens as well. This was one of the problems with thalidomide. This drug, when tested on conventional experimental animals such as rats or mice, would have not detected the teratogenicity of thalidomide. This is a note of caution. When new drugs are being marketed and tested on one or two species of animals, there still may be a missing detection of teratogenicity. The ultimate proof of teratogenicity is whether it, there is demonstrable harm to the human embryo. The susceptibility also reflects the sensitivity or resistance of a particular organism, tissue, or developmental system. That, in turn, reflects the capacity to regenerate completely without evidence of harm or repair, which may be relatively perfect or imperf imperfect. Just remember that congenital malformations very often are more frequent in males than in females, and that in itself indicates a contrast of susceptibility. Permit me to uh, remind you that you should read what is stated in these frames. The comments are secondary and minimal. You can stop the motion to read at leisure. We spoke of susceptibility and will continue here. Susceptibility then also reflects the stage of development. There are refractory stages of development. Certain tissues don't even exist. Or once a development is completed and the cells are not dividing, then the action of teratogen may be limited. So organogenesis in general is portrayed as the most sensitive period in regards to the formation of malformations. I like to only remind you that blastopathies, which is a stage of very early development before the implantation of the embryo, is of great interest in the study of congenital malformations. Anencephaly has something to do with the formation of the axis 
of the human body and a failure of the development of the cephalic end of what will become the spinal cord. Conjoined twins reflect a problem earlier than this. It is when one egg forms an axis and then by an anomaly forms a second one. So please read at leisure and consider these points. Again, here I stress that male and females are distinct. Lastopathies as a group are prevalent in females. This principle is most important because it distinguishes teratology from generalities of toxicology. Unfortunately, we have terms like reproductive toxicology. So, pay attention to the fact that the pathogenesis triggered by teratogens is specific and not general. For instance, thalidomide rarely impacts cerebral development, and if so, it does minimally. And so does alcohol develop certain developmental pathways to the extent that we can clinically diagnose fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. If the impacts or pathogenesis were at random, then clinical teratology would not exist. This principle brings us to the manifestations, the phenotypes. And it is important to remember that this phenotype spectrum is not only reflecting a particular teratogen, but also when it did act and on what sort of sensitivity and repair capacity acted upon. The four main manifestations are death, teratonasia, malformation, but also maybe growth retardation and functional deficits. So please read this at leisure. And consider in particular the importance of alteration of growth, hemihypertrophy, the growth failure of children with Down syndrome and so forth. All the examples mentioned previously relate to concentration, peak doses, and duration of exposure. Alcohol is a particularly good example because it is bench drinking, that is the peak dose, and the repeated peak doses are the factors that determine the spectrum, the very wide spectrum of fetal alcohol impacts. It depends when, and it depends for how long. The same applies to strontium or cesium, and for instance, the physical half-life of cesium may be 20 years, but once incorporated in the body, it gets excreted in about one year, the half-life. But if it is bound to a cell that is, let's say, eternal, that will not divide thereafter, that little radioactive element will be releasing energy and breaking structures in its vicinity for as long as that cell in that tissue is contaminated by a analog called cesium-137. Consider these points. And finally, the sixth principle. 
underscores that the manifestations of deviant development may differ in function of degree, dosage, and duration of exposure, but there may be no detectable effects to total lethality. So the concept is then this threshold, something that scientists have to consider in particular when performing experimental studies or epidemiologic analysis that frequently requires the application of dose response curves and when there is a dose related increase in teratogenesis that's one of the strongest proofs that a medication or other risk factor is teratogenic. In the next frame, we are going to show you all six principles, and I will continue there. So we have reached the end. Here are the six principles for you to review and to try to remember when you see a patient. Is the patient very susceptible? Is it susceptible because of the genotype or because the environmental factors are terrible? Is it because it was exposed very early or even before implantation? Or is it because the exposure is continuous or has peaks and valleys? Is it related to some function, although you cannot see a structural anomaly? Certainly some children of alcoholic mothers will have terrible behavioral deviations, and yet the physical manifestations may be minimal. So consider these points because they are directly relevant to an analysis of a child with developmental disabilities. I will end by saying that this morphology is a subset or a discipline related to teratology that views these principles in the context of the clinic. And I presume most of the listeners are potential or real clinicians. Thank you for your attention and I invite you to see the tutorial concerning drugs, concerning prescriptions. Thank you again.